Get Rich Education is brought to you by Ridge Lending Group, Mid-South Homebuyers, and GRETurnkey.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hi, and welcome to GRE, Get Rich Education, episode 158. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Today, we're talking about how you can make a single-family rental home produce $36,000 worth of gross monthly income, resulting in $10,000 worth of monthly cash flow for yourself. Well, it entails some more work and training on your part compared to turnkey real estate investing, but it might just be worth considering because it could get you to financial freedom faster. The answer is with one single family home converted into a small residential assisted living home for seniors, and it's more accessible to everyday people than you might think. That's what we're going to discuss in a bit today. Down the road on an upcoming show, we're going to talk about negotiation, negotiation in both real estate and really just in your overall life as well. I'm going to give you some of my best negotiation techniques. Here's one of them, for example. When you're negotiating with, say, a plumber before he does some work for you, let's say that he throws out a final price that you both agree on, 500 bucks or whatever. Instead of you saying, I agree with that price, we have a deal. Instead, try saying, I agree with that price if you can start first thing tomorrow morning. Well, then maybe the plumber will come back to you with, I can't start tomorrow. How about the following day? Well, then your response could be, that works, but you'll need to finish in two days instead of three. So as long as he counters your request, you continue to ask for additional concessions. It's not always about the money. A lot of people on the other side think it's just about the money, but you negotiate one step beyond that. That technique is what I call, make sure you get the final concession. We're going to talk about negotiation techniques like that on an upcoming show. And for that show, we're also going to have the director of the American Negotiation Institute with us here. So we'll see how he thinks my negotiation ideas stack up to his. And we're also going to hear his ideas because, well, it's what he does for a living. So I bet that he's got some great negotiation technique material that we've never thought about. Now, before we get into the assisted living home twist on buy and hold real estate investing today, importantly, The scarcity mentality is abundant and the abundance mentality is scarce. That's one of those things I I guess I'm known for being said for. We need to keep that in mind, both in investing and how we treat ourselves and our families and others. Why spend a day thinking about how to live below your means when you can instead expand your means with the actual ideas like we're talking about all the time here at Get Rich Education and like we'll be talking about again today? What is the scarcity mentality? It's people who think that financial betterment means cutting your expenses. What is the abundance mentality? That's people who already know that financial betterment means increasing your income, not cutting expenses. You can only cut expenses so much to the downside. And when you do that, you're living worse anyway. You're voluntarily cutting your own standard of living. Instead, when you expand your means, you're living better and there is absolutely no limit to how far you can expand. What does a scarcity mentality look like? Hey, if you track this credit card points program for half your life, then you can get 5% off apparel from this selection of department stores. Oh, and then three months later, it rotates around to you getting a free hot dog from 7-Eleven once a week. Oh, jeez. (laughs) your mental bandwidth is being occupied with the wrong thoughts. Hey, with this coupon code, you can get 30% off Ray-Ban sunglasses, but to get it, you've got to like, comment, and then share this post with 10 friends. Oh, jeez. I mean, how many of those activities would you have to engage with in order to, say, live in the neighborhood of your choice or... How much of that would you have to do to truly make a meaningful increase 
in your standard of living. Well, you couldn't do enough of any of those things to make an impact on what really matters in your life. And that's my point. Now, your parents probably told you how to live below your means and might have even said those words, live below your means, but they just didn't know how to tell you to expand your means. A lot of times it comes down to standard of living. You know full well that if your parents loved you, then they wanted your standard of living to be better than theirs. They just didn't say it because homo sapiens are biogenetically, psychologically programmed and predisposed to revert into survival mode, to not get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. But civilization has improved upon that, and that's why we're not in survive mode here on this show, Why Merely Survive When You Can Thrive. I want to see you have the means to live a life chock full of great, great experiences. And that's got nothing to do with stupid social media discount codes for beef jerky or whatever. Have great experiences. And you know something? No matter how big your paycheck is, you still can't buy yesterday. You can't buy it back. Did you go deer hunting with your son recently? Did you take your daughter to Yosemite National Park this past summer? What's going to open up the time for experiences in your life? It's doing something expansionary that will better your standard of living. Fill your life with great yesterdays as well as great tomorrows. No matter how big your paycheck is, you still can't buy back what you chose to do yesterday. So it comes down to passive income, passive income. That's what's going to allow you to fill your life with both great experiences and a nice stuff. Both of those things. I mean, why choose between great experiences or nice stuff? Have both. That's the abundance mentality. We talk about how to expand your means virtually every week, and we're going to be doing that here again today. Today's guest is the renowned authority on how you can profit from assisted living homes. Doing well while doing good is what he calls it. Doing well for yourself by being a profiteer while doing good for society by serving seniors the right way. Let's talk about it. With more than 30 years of real estate investing experience, four books and two radio shows under his belt, today's guest is also a certified financial planner. He's appeared on the cover of Real Estate Wealth Magazine. He's also a master public speaker. Today, he owns the Residential Assisted Living Academy, where he shows you how you can make one single-family home generate between $5,000 and $15,000 every month. And by the way, that's not gross income. That's your cash flow. That's your monthly income minus expenses. And just wait until you learn about the next big thing that he's launching, which we're going to discuss today. I first met today's guest at a live event, and ever since, I seem to run into him a lot of places that I go, and I don't know of any greater authority in the world on serving and profiting with assisted living homes. I'd like to give a big welcome back on to Get Rich Education today, Gene Garino. Thank you, Keith. It's so awesome to be back. I appreciate you taking the time to share with everybody that's listening. Our population is aging, and we're going to need more senior housing. Can you put some numbers to that? Absolutely. There is 77 million baby boomers, and that is people that were born between 1946 and 1964. So for a lot of the your you know listeners, that could be their parents. And those baby boomers, they're in their early 70s right now. Now, they're not moving into assisted living. I know some of you want to move mom and dad in there, but <laughs> it could be their parents or your grandparents, and they are in assisted living. And the numbers right now are staggering. 10,000 people a day are turning 65 in our country, but 4,000 a day are turning 85. And that's the target demographic. Those are the people that will need help with their activities of daily living. And I just want to extrapolate to give you the number. 4,000 a day is 120,000 new 85-year-olds every single month. And that's 1.4 million new 85-year-olds every single year. Right now, in all of assisted living in the U.S., there's about 1.4 million people. So that population of who needs this help is literally doubling every single year. That's astounding. Now, you found a way to best serve this growing demographic through assisted living homes, but it's typically not with some big institutional place. It's more with a single family home sort of setting. So tell us why a single family home setting rather than a larger building. 
When I first heard about this, I heard it from the profit side. How do I make money on this? And certainly that is a focus. But as my mom aged and she needed help, then I started to see it from the user side and the experience. And what I found, Keith, is that you don't want to move mom into a hotel or an apartment building. She wants to stay at home. So not home-like, but actually having a home, a residential home that's a group home for the elderly was a much better solution. And then from a business standpoint, I didn't have in my mind to raise $30 million to put up a large 200-bed facility, but getting a single-family home, doing some conversion and using it for this purpose can be incredibly profitable. There's certainly an opportunity here. This is a demographic that's growing. This is a need that's got to be served Really, when someone has an interest in this, once they have a little bit of education, really, where's the best place for them to start? Do they start with looking for a property or do they start with looking with prospective residents or where does one get going and start? It's a great question because a lot of people start at the wrong point. And in this industry itself, residential assisted living, the first thing is location. And when I say location, it's really about the demographics. We want to have the right number of people and then the right financial means where they're and they're making above average income, not average or low income. A lot of times people come to me, they go, I got the perfect house for this. And well, where is it? And it's in the middle of nowhere. And it's like nobody's going to go there. You could have the perfect house, but if it's out of the way, it's not where people are, then nobody's going to drive there to go see it. Nobody's going to go visit mom there. So location is the number one criteria. Number two, then, is finding out what the rules of the game are. Every time we play a new board game, it's always, well, how do I win? And then what are the rules? And the rules of the game, in this case, what can I do in a certain area and what can I do? And more importantly, what do they call it? We get that all the time where somebody goes and they check out zoning or rules or regulation and they call it the wrong thing. Maybe they call it assisted living facilities, but in their state, it's called a personal care home. So then they say, oh, you can't do that here. Well, you called it the wrong thing. You made that mistake. And the government official isn't going to correct you or educate you or teach you. So number one is location, and it's the demographic of the people that live there. Now, we talk an awful lot about buy and hold residential income property, and location is so important there. And typically, we're talking about location with respect to things like proximity to jobs and industry. But in this case, with an assisted living home, you don't necessarily want or need so much proximity to jobs and industry because your residents at an assisted living home are typically not going to be working anymore. And really, it comes down to you often want proximity to those children and those family members, right? That's one reason you don't want to be off in the middle of nowhere with your choice of location. Exactly right. Grandma, she doesn't need a job, right? She doesn't need to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's past that. But what we really do want is, I'll give you the avatar, the perfect place to be would be a neighborhood, a location that is upper income, not top of the top, but above average. So above average income. And the demographics there are homeowners who are in their 50s and 60s. That's your demographic because that's the family member who's going to be paying for mom and dad's care. So if we find that neighborhood, so it's not a brand new neighborhood or by the college campus, it doesn't need to be near the bus line and it doesn't need to be near hospitals. A lot of people think that's it. No, if grandma's in the hospital, then we're past where we need it. So the demographic I'm looking for is 50 to 60 years old, above average income, and the more people, the better. And you don't necessarily go looking for these properties on a big online resource like LoopNet or Craigslist necessarily. Where do you actually find the right property that you're describing? The right property itself is, frankly, not hard to find once you know what you're looking for. So if everybody starts with the concept of location is first, what I'm looking for is not mountains, hills and beachfront. It is the right location based on the demographics. That's the key. The next part is the property itself. I don't care if it comes from MLS or LoopNet or from a sign in the front yard. The locating of the property, more importantly, it's the location of because I can scrape away the house and build it new. We can fix or repair or change or add on to anything that exists at the right location. So I'm going to say something that's going to be total opposite of what we as educators teach our people that listen is that I can pay full retail and still do really well with this because it's about the cash flow, not getting the property at 30 percent below fair market value. We've all heard the term you make your money when you buy. Well, in this case, you make your money from the cash flow. And I do want to talk because I know you and I had a little pre-discussion here that there's a lot of people listening. It's all about the 
that cash flow passive income where they own something and it just generates income. And I want to make sure that people are very clear that in what I do, there are two components, the real estate and the business. Right. So I just want to focus, yeah, just on that business part separately. Let's talk the real estate. The real estate, if you're a buy and hold investor, which a lot of you are, you can buy and hold and it could be a single family home, rent it to a family. They move in for a year or two, move out. So we have turnover. You've got vacancy. You've got repair costs on the way through. If you took a single family home that was appropriate, the right location, the right size and setup and so on for residential assisted living. And if you leased it to an operator who's going to operate this group home in that residential setting, number one, they're probably going to want a five year lease, not a one year lease. And most people that I know that do buy and hold are tickled pink with a five year lease. <laughs> That's one. Two, they're more than willing to pay a higher than fair market rent because they're going to be making a boatload of money. And if you're willing to do what you do and I do as a real estate investor, down payments, fix up cost, everything that goes with it, they want to operate a business. So when you think about it, most people who operate a business do it in rented buildings, rented land. Every franchise you see, somebody owns the dirt, somebody owns the building, somebody owns the business, and one is leasing it to the other. So if you just want to own the real estate, the bricks and sticks and the dirt and so on, you can do that and lease the building to the operator. They can do the lease improvements, the tenant improvements. They'll want a long-term lease because they're going to operate a business that's going to be incredibly profitable. But in the meantime, if you're making twice the fair market rent or twice of what you're getting now, well, you're making great cash flow too. That's right. So there are a few ways for one to go ahead and operate here. They can own the real estate themselves and go ahead and rent it to others, others operating that business, or they could own both the real estate and the business. Or are there other models that one could embrace? There is. There's another model that we're starting to develop ourselves with some of our students, and I'm going to call it the Golden Girls model. And I think for a lot of your listeners, this could be a tremendous hybrid. And what that looks like is take a home and just imagine a a single level. So people call that a ranch or a bungalow or a, a single level home, no stairs. And instead of renting it to a family, you could rent it out to seniors and they're renting a room, a bedroom, and then they're sharing the family room, kitchen and so on. So the Golden Girls model, a show from the 80s, for those of you not familiar with that. So there's not assisted living involved. They may have not required, may have somebody come visit them to check on them, help with medication management or food or cleaning or so on. But if you just rented it to four individuals that now have the camaraderie of each other, instead of renting the whole home for 1500 you might rent each room for 1000 and include all the utilities and be able to net that double, that extra 2000 when it's all said and done. Yeah, so from the investor perspective, when you're starting to talk about numbers like that, and we'll talk about some more numbers in a moment that ought to get you really excited, you begin to understand why you can pay full price for a place. So it really comes down to location, which is obviously so important in real estate because it's something that's so difficult to change. You're not so much going out there and looking for an existing single family home that might be in a poor location, but has already been converted and already has grab bars built in for seniors or already has a stair lift. Those things are secondary or tertiary considerations to the location because you can always go ahead and retrofit the home the way you need to once you have that fixed location. Just tell us a little bit about those physical things that need to take place once you buy a home, grab bars, stair lifts, those sort of things that seniors need. With the home, if I were to give you kind of the top criteria of what to look for in a checklist form, I would say single level is better than two or three story because then we don't have to worry about mobility issues, although there's ways to alleviate or address that. Single level, bigger is better. So I'm going to give you a rule of thumb that we teach at the academy. And that's 300 square feet of living space per resident. So if your home is licensed for 10, if you had a 3,000 square foot home, that would be very comfortable. The state will only require half that size. You could have a 12 or 1,500 square foot house with 10 residents, and legally you can do that. Those are the state minimums. But I'm going to tell you 300 square feet, much more comfortable. We can charge more. Bathrooms. Two bathrooms is the minimum, but more is better. So if you have three or four bathrooms, that's better. And if you can convert space into bathrooms or take one big bathroom, make it into two, that's good too. Smooth floors. So in, now we're inside, right? The smooth floors uh, as opposed to shag carpet in the old days, a wood floor, a tile floor, a linoleum floor. You mentioned the grab bars around showers and toilets. Easy to do that. Widen the doorways to 36 inch if you can, a wide 
residential door, not a 42 inch with a push bar. The home doesn't need to be ADA compliant, but ramps to the front. If it's uh, three steps up, you certainly need a ramp. But even if it's just four inches to move in to the home itself, you could have a little bit of a ramp there just to make it smooth and easy for anybody, including a senior. So we can go on with that list, but the location of the house critical. And inside the neighborhood, let's just say you're in the perfect neighborhood, but you're in the back of the neighborhood and they got to spend 10 minutes going through, turn left at the third pine tree and then right at the rock. I'd rather you be the first house to the right inside the front gate. And that's the house that other people may look at and say, well, I don't want that house. You're, everybody passes you. It's got a small yard. It's uh, got the sewer drainage or the uh, drainage ditch in the back and the power lines over the corner. Perfect. We don't really care about the yard. I, I want that exposure. I want that convenience. First house on the right. Yeah, we need to think about things differently than we do with just plain old residential units. One of those thoughts is with zoning, but I think oftentimes those zoning rules are more on our side as assisted living home investors than some think. You know, you're perfect right there, that comment, because so many people say zoning, zoning, zoning. And let me just share this. The Fair Housing Act works in our favor because you cannot discriminate against age and sex and, and everything else. So age, we can't discriminate who lives in a home. You need to make sure you understand this is a group home. It's not a business. Well, Gene, what if there's an HOA and says there's no business allowed in the neighborhood? Well, fine. We're not a business. We're a group home. And those words are critically important. Now, the HOA virtually has no power because the state has rules for this. The county has rules for this. And as long as you follow the rules that the state and the county have put together, and you follow, fill in the paperwork, make your application and so on, you're fine. It doesn't matter what the HOA nosy neighbor down the left says or thinks. So the Fair Housing Act works in our favor. You can do it in the nicest neighborhoods. But also, if you're looking for a place and less hassle, go to the neighborhood without the HOA. They're all over the place, too. We talk about things that are mission critical here, and to me, that means providing others with housing that's clean, safe, affordable, and functional, and we would want to have all those things checked when we go ahead and serve seniors. With that in mind, and realizing that's mission critical, let's talk about the numbers a little bit and just how profitable it can be for an investor. We take a look at a profit and loss statement on a monthly basis for a buy and hold residential unit typically have the rent on the income side, maybe some laundry income as well. And then over on the expense side, typically we have mortgage, vacancy, insurance, management, taxes, and utilities. Those are kind of the income and expenses on your P&L for residential. Now, how does that look different for assisted living home operations on a monthly basis? And feel free to go ahead and put some real numbers to that for us, Gene. You bet. And again, I want to make sure everybody knows real estate aside, you own the real estate in one entity, you can lease it to yourself, but the rent that you could receive could be up to twice the fair market rent. So just the normal expenses you just mentioned for owning real estate and having a tenant would be the same on that side. On the business side, there's kind of three parts to it. One is the real estate, which you just described. Two is just operating. And I, this so one time I'm going to use the word Kate, operating this as a business there may be a business license required. It may be $100 a month. In some states, it's $200 a year, so it's $18 a month. But there's a business license. In addition to that, there's people that are taking care of the residents, so there's caregivers. One of the rules of thumb that we use, in again, in our training is 40% or less of the gross income. If we're spending more than 40% of the gross income on our staff, and whether that be caregivers or management or whoever, then it's going to be hard for us to make significant profit. So 40% or less there. The house is separate. That's just a, it'll show up as a rent payment. Food, uh, food in an assisted living home, get this, is about five to eight dollars per day per person. Now everybody blows, they're blown away by that because they spent ten dollars for a Big Mac and a Coke, you know, but right. Yeah. Five to eight because number one, a senior eats a quarter of what you and I eat. Two, the food is prepared in the home by the caregivers, so it's made on site, not from a restaurant with all their overhead. In addition to that, I like to go on the high end. So my homes are in the seven, eight dollars a day because if somebody wants filet mignon, you got it. You want shrimp, you got it. You want cheesecake, you got it. Because it doesn't cost that much more. And it's just food is like one of their primary things. So five to eight dollars a day, I go on the high end. Salaries and what you're paying for the care, 40 percent or less. After all expenses, and this includes marketing and it includes license and includes insurance and so on, I want 30% of the gross income to come to the bottom line. 
And I'm going to pause for a moment because if you are listening and you've done business before and I say EBITDA or 30% coming to the bottom line, that is a huge number. A grocery store might have 3%. You know, Facebook loses money. So when I say 30%, that's really, really chunk. That's a beautiful, juicy number that everybody can get their hands on. Now, you don't have to make that much. You can do it with less. But if you're making more than that, that's even better. But 30% is the benchmark I use. Another one is I want to be profitable or break even, even if I'm 60% occupied. If I'm licensed for 10 and I've got all of my full boat expenses, and if I've got six people in there, 60% occupied, I'm still profitable. That means seven, eight, nine, 10 are just pure profit. In a rental home, as you guys know, you rent it out, you're great. As soon as they leave, you're 100% vacant, you're 100% sucking wind and losing money. Apartment buildings are the same thing. You get to a point where what is our break even and might be 70% or whatever it is, and everything after that is the good stuff. So back to the expenses, one more category. We've got the real estate, we've got the business, and then you've got the, I'm going to call it the all-inclusive or the club med expenses. When you have a care home, everything is paid for for that resident. They pay 5000 a month, and that includes their food. It includes the heat, the AC. It includes the cable TV. It includes the newspaper. It includes all of those things that others would pay extra for in their own home budget. We certainly don't have those expenses until we have a client, a tenant, or in this case, it's called a resident, not a tenant, but that is our third category of expenses. Well, there are some really great rules of thumb in there for how to forecast how this might look and what might be a profitable assisted living home. I mean, can you tell Gene is a 30 plus year real estate investor and he's invested in all types of real estate and he's just found a niche that's really profitable. So he knows about these rules of thumb. Now, Gene, you mentioned earlier how in that business model, oftentimes you want to attract those private paying residents, not so much the Medicare ones. And if you attract those private paying ones, I would imagine that you can get substantially better income from them than you can the Medicare paying ones. So it's worth it to go ahead and pay $8 a day for filet mignon type of meals than it is for $5 a day mac and cheese type of meals to cater to that higher end clientele because your expenses probably don't increase proportionally to a much greater increase that you get from those private payers and attracting them to your place versus the Medicare ones. Any tips on attracting those private payers since that's really the way to maximize your income? The way we do our homes and when our students are doing their homes, the way we teach it is I only want you to focus on the private pay. If you're focusing on Medicare, Medicaid, state, whatever, you're not going to be able to make good money. And when I say good money, you need enough money to pay the caregivers to have good food, good house, and make profit. You can't do that on $1,500 a month from the state or $2,000 a month from the state. So I only want my students to focus on the private pay. So the private pay is how much can you get? Anything you can name your price. And I'm not saying they'll pay it, but there is no limit as to what you charge. So I want you to think of this again. All of your listeners here are thinking passive income and also they understand real estate very well. When you think about apartments, A class, B class, C class, if you do C class apartments, certainly you can fill it. But the clientele that you have is someone to just say is on the lower end. They can afford less. They act different and so on. I want you to be thinking A class in these properties here. Now, we actually teach a five level. Level one is the bottom. Level five is the top. But ABC is sufficient. A nicer property. With a nicer property, we can certainly charge more. And then, as you mentioned, the food doesn't cost much more, but it is incredibly important. So A class in your mindset of what you're thinking, you're charging more and it's private pay. Now, where do people get the money from? A few people, 10% will have a an actual insurance policy called a long-term care insurance policy, but 90% don't. They're paying for it out of mom's estate, whether it be the income from the pension plan or whether it be the house that they lived in and now is being sold, whether it be IRAs, 401ks, whether it be other investments they have, all of that estate is being used in bits and pieces and dribs and drives and being liquidated to pay for the care for mom and dad for the last two years or 10 years. And after that is done, then it's the family. If the family doesn't want mom to be living in a kind of a state run or state affordable institutional type setting that you can smell the neglect walking in the front door, they're going to pony up. Yeah, they're going to be chipping in a thousand bucks per kid and it's four or five thousand a month. But the average in the country is thirty six hundred dollars a month. 
for an average home. So throughout the country, the range is, you know, from one to the other. And in some states, in areas of some states, people are paying eight and ten thousand dollars per month for one person to live in a home and be taken care of in the way we're talking about. Yeah, that's astounding. So with the average of thirty six hundred dollars per month per resident times ten, that's thirty six thousand dollars worth of gross monthly income for the assisted living home. And then going ahead and subtracting out those expenses that we talked about, that's how you can arrive at a number of five thousand to fifteen thousand dollars of passive monthly cash flow. Is that right? As a matter of fact, that's exactly right. And that's what I use as an example, an average, because it is top to bottom, soup to nuts. If I go average, we're good. But if you can make that kind of money on an average home and now we step it up like I highly encourage you to do to a nicer home, you can charge more and your expenses are virtually the same. And sometimes that takes a different mindset. Oftentimes when we're talking about turnkey single family residential homes, sometimes A class works, but sometimes it doesn't because the purchase prices are significantly greater proportionally to those rent incomes that don't quite keep up with those. But here in the assisted living space, it's somewhat different. Now, one of those expenses that we have on our profit and loss statement as an assisted living home owner is that of a manager, a manager that manages over the caretakers. So I think as residential real estate investors, we're pretty familiar with what our property manager does for us. How does that differ from what an assisted living home manager's role is? The manager in an assisted living home is truly managing the business, not the tenants, as you might say, or the repairs that would be needed, but they're managing the business. So the first order of business is to have caregivers underneath them. So it's the finding the training and the retaining of those staff members, the caregivers, is their A number one job on that side. On the other side, it is getting the word out, marketing, so that the residents know that you exist and people can move into the home knowing what you do, where you are. So on one side, they're a big part of the marketing effort of bringing clientele to the property, doing tours, signing them in, signing them up. They move in. So that's akin to like a leasing agent, but it's different right? More to it. And on the other side, it's the maintaining of the staff. So finding the right people to be the caregivers, who's going to repair the AC, who's going to, and a lot of that is on the manager of that property. So you as the landlord on one side, pretty easy. You collect a check, you pay your bills, you get profit, you have depreciation, you you got it. But in this, you're managing a business. Your job, if you do it the way I teach you to, is to manage the manager. So we get a good manager, give them the tools they need, and now they operate that business under my direction. But if I do it right, and this is the part I really, really, really love about the business part here, Keith, I can do five to 10 hours a week, and that includes my wife going to visit the homes once a week. I may not go for a month or two, but I'm on the the phone a couple of times a week. I'm on Skype a couple of times, maybe once a week, and then payroll. My job is to make sure the business is running smoothly, but I don't need to be there day to day. Yeah, well, there's some relative passivity there for sure. And I'm sure this has a lot of us interested in looking into assisted living homes. It's maybe not the thing for highly busy people to do, but yet it might be. It's probably not as hands-off as turnkey real estate investing, but as you just heard Gene describe, it can be relatively close to passive. Well, I'm going to ask Gene some more things. I want to ask more about the different business models and how available is financing to the everyday individual investor so that you can get on an assisted living home. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is the Residential Assisted Living Academy's Gene Garino. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Cashflow real estate investors, if you're looking for a mortgage loan with a company that specializes in investment property loans, it's Ridge Lending Group. They provide income property loans in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of investors and homeowners all over the country. In fact, with ethics and transparency, they've helped more people realize their dreams through real estate investing than any other mortgage lender in the country. Get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Hey, everybody, this is Matt Bowles from Maverick Investor Group. You're listening to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And don't quit your daydream. 
Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Gene Garino, the founder of the Residential Assisted Living Academy. He tells you how to serve others and make fantastic, in fact, almost incredible cash flow from one single family home by making that an assisted living facility. So, Gene, just talk to us a little bit more about some of the risks, some of the potential downsides, liability insurance, licensing, and are there some considerations state to state? How does that look? You got it. And when you say risks or downside, I look at it as challenges and and a barrier to entry. And I like that because, you know, we have a lot of people listening and I know some people just want to write a check and you can do that. And others just want to own the real estate and be totally hands off passive income. And you can do that. But if you are going to operate, there are some things that are a barrier to entry for others that we go through to get. And I'll describe some of those. Nothing that anybody can't do. You absolutely can, but it's okay if they just want to be passive and invest, and I'm cool with that. So the idea of the rules, there's different rules in each state. Some have a lot of rules, and it's very clear, and others, we literally helped a student open the very first residential assisted living home in the entire state of Rhode Island. Wow. Yeah. So we've done it from the beginning to the end. In Arizona, where I am, there's 3,000 of these homes. There's an entire department with the health services. There's a floor there. That you So there's a whole department here. There's one home in another state. So each state has rules. And then from there, and I want you to know that the three key points of what it takes to get licensed are number one, senior safe home. So think about senior safe. It's got grab bars near the toilets and tubs and whatever. Grab bars, smoke detectors, maybe sprinklers or fire suppression, ramps to the front door, senior safe. So that's all retrofit and things you add and so on. The second one is an administrator. So an administrator is the manager. Now, it's called different things. Could be called administrator, facility operator. It could be called numbers of different things throughout the country. But that's the person who has a license, the qualification, whatever the state requires. And that could be a 24-hour course in some states, uh, up to a two-year experience level and 160 hours of training and tests and so on in other states. So it depends on what requirement it is, but there has to be somebody who's qualified to manage and facilitate that. I don't do that. I hire somebody else. And I'm in one of those states that has the highest level, the two-year gauntlet, but I can pay $600 a month to have a license hung on the wall. So I'm going to hire somebody else to do that. It's not me. So you need a senior safe home, and we can make it that way. Two, you need the administrator that's qualified according to the state. And then three, you need documentation. Now, just like any business, you should have standard operating procedures. In this industry, we call that policies and procedures. Everything from emergency plans to menus to assessment forms to medication management. But the paperwork, the documentation, those documents are required for the state to say, okay, you got somebody who can run the home day to day. You've got a safe home for the seniors and you have documentation to show you how to run it. And it allows us to know if you're following the rules. So those are the three key points in that the location is where you do it. The how much I think you started to ask a question, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, how do you finance that? Is that right? Yeah, I do want to ask you about how to finance that. Availability of financing, of course, is paramount to anyone getting their start. Gene, when we're talking about these improvements that one needs to make to a home, it's not just about financing the purchase of the home. Are those improvements like grab bars and things specific to seniors, are those items financeable? Yes, they are. Short answer. Now, let me just kind of run through the different ways to finance it. Number one, it's a residential home. It's non-owner occupied, so it's a rental property, non-owner occupied, think 20% down, You can buy it, you can rent it to your own company or somebody else's that's operating the care home. Non-owner occupied residential financing. There it is, number one. Number two, SBA, Small Business Administration. They are willing to guarantee that loan, a bank loan, for this business. So potentially they will finance the real estate, the rehab, even the business itself if you're purchasing the business from somebody else. Now, if you've never done this before, it's all brand new for you. They're going to look for, do you have knowledge, education? Like, did you come to Gene's training? Do you have people on your team that have done this before? Even if you're new to this, if you surround yourself with the right people and you have the right knowledge base and support and so on, they'll still finance that. In addition to that, there's a program called USDA that we all think of beef and dairy, but USDA, Agricultural Properties, 
And what if what they define that as is a community, according to the 2010 census, of 35,000 or less. So if that community, according to the 2010 census, is 35,000 people or less, well, they'll provide money for the real estate, the rehab, the buying of the business, the blue sky of getting up and running and so on. That's a tremendous source. You can also do private financing. I love working with private investors because there's so much money out there looking for a home. And this is a compelling story. Fix and flip, buy and hold, storage units, have been there, done that. When you talk about seniors, baby boomers, the rates of return that we can get, people are incredibly interested in this. Easiest thing I've ever raised capital for from private lenders. IRAs, self-directed IRAs, helping to tap into that trillions of dollars sitting in cash. Again, when you know how to present yourself properly. There's other sources, too, like syndication, which is a great way to raise capital for this from private lenders and investors. And they're investing in a syndication either for a property, a fund or a group of properties or an open ended syndication. And then crowdfunding. I was literally on the phone today with one of our crowdfunding resources, and we're developing that platform because we've got people raising money in a crowdfunding site And we're looking to develop that to the next level so it becomes a pretty significant resource as well. Yeah, there are some remarkable financing options there. And I think a lot of times there's backing because people and agencies just know that this is a demographic need and there's only going to be a greater and greater need for senior housing. Gene approaches this from a very professional way. And if you learn from Gene, you will learn how to scale this and do this professionally and make a lot of profit. There's basically a casual way of approaching investing, or there's a professional way of approaching investing. And it's really not a whole lot different with just classic buy and hold residential real estate. A lot of couples out there, the reason that they own a rental property is because maybe the wife used to own that condo before the husband and wife got married, and they just left the condo behind, and rather than sell it, they just have it as a rental, and their income doesn't even cover their mortgage, but they think that that's a good deal. I think in the same sense, sort of the casual or unprofessional approach to residential assisted living is you might have a husband and a wife that are older now and their kids have moved out of the home and you have these two empty bedrooms, these two empty nests that are left behind. And the husband and wife think, well, maybe it's a good idea to go ahead and rent those out to seniors. And you may very well be able to do that, but you're probably not approaching it from the most professional, scalable and profitable way. And you might be in a scenario where the husband and wife start to feel trapped. They can't go on vacation. They can't go anywhere. And they just really didn't think about this big picture or undertake a lot of these considerations that you learn about through someone like Gene and the Residential Assisted Living Academy. A lot of times, Gene, now even for someone that does approach this from a professional standpoint, and they do go ahead and buy a single family assisted living home that they might rent to eight or 10 residents, A lot of times the problem for that professional might just be getting that first resident in there. Sometimes that can be a little bit of a hurdle to overcome. So how can one meet that need? And I want to take everything you just said and add one piece to it to answer this question. One of the reasons why people do this and they're doing this now is they're thinking about the future. So that one resident literally could be your parent or a grandparent. And right now, that person, and I want you all to be thinking, because you may be 30 years old or 40 years old, and you're thinking, hey, this is, these were old people. It's decades away. Hey, your time will come. <laughs> but at some point, we're all going to need help with our activities of daily living. And if you're in a point where I am, where you're 50, 60 years old, your parents are 80, 90 years old, well, at some point, if they need help, now somebody's going to pay for it. And if it's 5000 8000 a month, wouldn't it be better to own your own home? They live in the master bedroom for free and you've got nine other people writing you a check for five or six or eight grand a month. So you're making a huge profit. So I want you to be selfish and be thinking forward. Do one home for yourself so that you are comfortably living out last days, but you're not leaving a burden to the kids. And some of you are going to be facing that and I know for a fact you will listen back and you'll think to yourself, I remember when in this state here, when Keith told me I should be thinking about this, because if you don't have that, you will be writing that check. So your first resident could be a family member. And if you're totally agreed, that first one in the home is always the hardest one because it's a group home and nobody wants to be first. Right. So if you're moving somebody in and I say this jokingly, but you can do a rent to grandma. (laughs) <laughs> I'm joking, but you can have an open house where you have elderly people there. Maybe they're just visiting and so on. You can have one person move in at a very discounted rate so that, hey, you're the first. Yours is 3000 a month instead of 5000 a month. 
So people do want to see that first person in there. There are strategies for that. But then the second and third and fourth are easier. And then after that, it fills up quickly because people are saying, well, now I see it. I can envision it. I see it. I see the community who's living here with me and so on. But the first one is priming the pump. Yeah, we're talking about strategies to get that first resident in a home that you've gone ahead and closed on. Oftentimes that can be the most difficult one. Residents don't want to move into a place that feels dead or they might wonder, well, why is nobody living here? What is wrong with this place? Well, there's nothing wrong with the place. You might have just closed on it and you need to get that first resident. So, Gene, we want to do well here, and we also kind of want to minimize what I call ROI, return on involvement. We want to get a good return on involvement with what we're doing. That's sort of another way to think of ROI and make this turnkey. But we also want to know that residents are being cared for. So what's a good indicator, maybe after someone's bought a home and they do get it filled with some residents, what's a good indicator? How can one know that they're operating and really giving good value to the residents that are there? Well, those are kind of two different questions because return on involvement, I love the way you said that. I wrote that down. That's really uh, very cool. Yeah. So the involvement part, I do encourage you to be less involved. Now, we can go the other direction, and I, I'm very sensitive to the fact that some people are all about the social aspect of it, that I can take care of people, and that's great. But the ROI return on it, you know, your involvement, if you're benchmarking on what I suggest, five to 10 hours a week. I went to one of my homes today, literally just to drop off a check, and I was there for 10 minutes. And in the home itself, I said hello to the residents. Do they recognize me? I don't know. I said hello to the two caregivers, and I gave them a big hug, thanked them for doing what they do, dropped off my piece of paper, the check in the envelope, and off I went. That's pretty low involvement. (laughs) Now, I could go there and be very involved. I could be asking a ton of questions, but having a manager who's in place that is overseeing the home, making sure that It only gets to me if it needs to get to me is very important for that. So the other part, the value for the resident. If grandma knew that it's costing $6,000 a month to live in that home, she'd have a heart attack and die. So there is no way to prove or explain value to mom or dad. For the family, who really is your customer, your client, their investment is you're taking care of this loved one. And with that loved one and that investment, their communication is really the key. So I would say above the food, above the caregivers, above the house, it's communicating with them uh, how you're taking care of mom and dad. If any incidents happen and what's happening and what's going on, as well as the food and the care. But this is what it costs. And it is that thirty six hundred on average. We want to be doing four five six thousand for our homes. It, we do give great value. Yeah, so we really want to do well here and operate well. And yes, we have an income and you might have the ability to drop by every once in a while and know if residents are getting their medications given to them as needed and to know that they might have just enjoyed a, a pan of lasagna that was just made for everybody. You want to have that communication with your manager there, just like you do with your residential income property manager. Well, Gene, as we're winding down here, is there just sort of any last thing that might be important that I didn't ask you about? You know, you asked some tremendous questions, and my guess is everybody listening has a lot more. I'm going to do something, and I know you're going to put it in the show notes for them, but I have a gift. It's a six-part training that is free. And go to the show notes and click on that link and get those six lessons. It won't take too long. It's an hour, hour, 20 minutes, but it'll give you a lot of great information and background on the business side and the operations side, but it'll answer a lot of the questions that you have. So you're going to put that in the show notes, I know. Download that. It's very valuable. Yes, you can go ahead and look out for that in the show notes. And then, Gene, you also have, you've masterminded the first annual, the inaugural Residential Assisted Living National Convention coming up in Scottsdale, Arizona. Tell us about that. So excited. November 10 and 11. And on those two dates, it's the national convention. I've traveled all over the country to the big box conventions, and they kind of look down their nose at us. And yet there's 40,000 of these properties throughout the country, and they're all separate, little separate entities. So I'm bringing it all together. Our academy has been training people from all over the country. We had somebody in our training from Australia this past week, even all over the world. But this is the National Convention for the Residential Assisted Living. So for those of you listening, you don't need to be a home operator. You don't need to be wanting to be that at all. You could be a real estate investor and just a, a money investor. You could be a lender. You could be an operator or a wannabe operator or just want to learn more about this business and be networking with people that are doing it. This is an opportunity to get together with hundreds of people from across the country 
this will be the place to be. And it's in Scottsdale. It's in November. It's the 10th and 11th. And if you'd like to get more information on that, go to the website, R-A-L-N-A-T-C-O-N. That stands for Residential Assisted Living National Convention. So R-A-L-N-A-T-C-O-N.com. All the information is there. Love to see you there. It's going to be phenomenal. We're, we've already got uh, 40% of the seats have already been pre-sold before you've even made it available. And you're one of the first ones, your listeners, to hear about this. You know, Gene, whenever we have these chats, I often get to thinking myself, now, why aren't I doing this? But then, you know, a couple hours later, I get to thinking about the things that I already have on my plate and I don't. So if you think you have any inclination toward doing this, I really suggest following up with Gene's resources. Gene Garino, thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm really impressed with Gene. He talks in such a, I'll call it a nutrient-dense way. He condenses a lot of information into a few sentences. And his trainings and influence in the assisted living home space seemingly expand every year. And when you talk to him, you know why. Now, I'm going to guess that it was perhaps six years ago I attended my state's government-run assisted living home training And you know what? They never talk about profiting there. I mean, like not at all. It was almost taboo to even bring up the topic that someone might have a profit motive that attended the class. Of course, we want to do good for others. But at that class, you might have gotten shut down if you asked questions about how profitable it was at this state run training. And I've talked to Gene about that. And he says that most state government run trainings are that way. Now, if you go to yours, it might scare you away because nearly all they talk about are the regulations. I think that when you engage with Gene's resources at the Residential Assisted Living Academy, you're going to get a bigger picture view, although you would probably want to attend both types of classes. Now, compared to long-term residential turnkey type of investing, assisted living homes, they do have longer-term tenants, and they also have what I'll call a low-impact type of tenant when you think about it. Now, if you're a busy type of person, turnkey residential could be a better space for you. But if you've got some time to do assisted living homes and just know that you have to solve some problems there, you can build a measure of financial freedom faster than you can with residential turnkeys. And Gene can help you solve a lot of those problems. So importantly, Gene said he spends about five to 10 hours a week kind of managing the ALH manager and looking over his properties. So It's not completely passive, but you can serve others and live a very good quality of life at the same time. And you could buy three or four or five single family assisted living homes. You don't have to stop with just one. So if you've got some momentum behind this, check out the Residential Assisted Living National Convention, the inaugural, the first one coming up in just a few weeks here in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's led by Gene. I bet that you've got a few questions that I didn't get time to ask about that Gene could help you with. You can check the show notes for those resources that Gene mentioned in that case. I'll be back next week to help you build your wealth. Although you might quit your day job, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.